Warmest solidarity greetings to everyone. Welcome to Migrants on Food Security and Sovereignty, an online forum organized by the International Migrants Alliance as part of its support and participation in the Global People's Summit for Just, Equitable, Healthy, and Sustainable Food Systems being led by the People's Coalition on Food Sovereignty, or PCFS. My name is Bong. I am a Filipino student who is based here in South Korea, and I will be your facilitator for today's forum. Um, before, before anything else, a few guidelines and some reminders. Please turn off your video or microphone if you are not going to speak. During the forum, the open forum, please use the raise hand button or message us on chat box if you wish to make an intervention. We have language interpretation for Bahasa Indonesia. So we would like to remind everyone to speak more slowly for the benefit on, of, your, of our interpreters if you're trying to, to speak. We are also live streaming on Facebook page of the International Migrants Alliance. And also at the end of our program, we would like to remind all our participants to prepare their placards for our group photo op. So some, some calls we can put on our placards are the following. Um, end corporate monopoly control on our food and agriculture. Fight for our fight for people's right to just food systems, uphold people's right to food sovereignty. We can also make use of the following hashtags. Hashtag our food systems, hashtag people's food sovereignty, hashtag hungry for change for number four. Thank you very much and um, I guess uh, yeah, uh, with all of that out of the way, I guess we could begin. Um, many of us think that food security and sovereignty is an issue only of farmers and those working in agriculture. Well, no, we, uh, we don't think that it is. It is everyone's issue, including all of us migrants. And to further shed light on the issue of food sovereignty, its relevance to peoples of all walks of life, and why we need to be involved in the campaign for it, we have with us today one of the global co-chairs of the People's Coalition on Food Sovereignty. So can you, can you all help me to welcome Ms. Uh, Ms. Sylvia, Ms. Sylvia Maliari. Ms. Sylvia? Yeah, thank you, Wong. Um, uh, can you hear me all right? Uh, is, is it my, is it okay, the audio? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, so greetings everyone and uh, good afternoon from Manila. As you can see, it's not so uh, really that uh, light in here. We have a storm and the uh, surroundings uh, are quite dark and um, I, I, I uh, we, just uh, hope that uh, we will bear with one another. Uh, yes, I am Sylvia from the People's Coalition on Food Sovereignty or the PCFS. And uh, we are more than uh, proud that uh, we can join you uh, this afternoon. As Ray said a while ago, this is the first time that uh, we'll be joining hands with you in a, the, a discussion of a topic which Wong said concerns us all. So um, I, I uh, hope that I'll be able uh, to be of uh, more than uh, a help to everyone in discussing uh, uh, our food systems, uh, question of food security and food sovereignty. Well, um, to start with, um, the current food situation is an international problem, right? And the current state of the food systems in the world is worse. And the struggle for food sovereignty is raging more than ever. In 2020, about 2.37 billion, nearly a third of the world's population suffered moderate to severe uh, state on food insecurity. According to the 2021 report on the state of food security and and nutrition in the world. Around 768 
million faced hunger in 2020, 118 million more than in 2019. By 2030, 660 million more may face hunger due to lack of access to adequate food security, partly because of the lasting effects of the pandemic to food insecurity. Add to this, 41 million people more in 43 countries are at risk of famine, up from 27 million in 2019. Movement restrictions have weakened supply chains, also causing mass job losses in the formal and informal sectors of the economy, limiting food availability for most, but especially in poorest households. Global unemployment is expected to stand at 205 million in 2022, more than the 187 million in 2019. Food and agricultural workers experience the highest incidence of working poverty and food insecurity. And of course, women are likely the first to go hungry as they bear the responsibility of feeding their families, as they make up a significant proportion of informal workers or small producers. Child labor has increased also to 160 million. And this child labor is mostly concentrated in the agricultural sector. We take note also of the government's locked and appalling responses like the corruption cases, which has made the situation ever worse. So we say that while the COVID pandemia has devastated millions and worsened the state of global hunger and poverty, we stress, we stress that the pandemic is just one of the various drivers of this global devastation. Long before the pandemic, the increasingly unsustainable monopoly capitalist production and consumption, the recurrent economic collapse, the environmental plunder, the unnecessary, unnecessary wastes that such anarchy breeds, as well as the wars of aggression and conflicts fueled by inter-imperialist competition for resources and territories have been feeding the pandemic of systemic and perpetual hunger. The already hungry and marginalized populations were the most vulnerable from the pandemic's impacts and its resulting crisis. All across the global South, many workers and urban poor communities are already struggling to access food regularly. They are of course faced with the loss of formal jobs and livelihood opportunities for the informal sector. And of course, as we said, rural food producers are severely restricted, displacing them from production areas, whether it be in, it in farms or seas, while others were forced to throw away their harvest that cannot be transported and sold to urban areas. Uh, let us look at certain experiences of migrant workers amidst the pandemia and resulting further in worsening food insecurity. Um, we have those working in the food and agriculture sector. For example, in India, movement restrictions ban fishing activities, which cause migrant fishers to be stranded in their boats at harbors. Some of them have died, reportedly. In Uganda, in Africa, farmers cannot go to their farms while migrant farm workers from the cities had to walk all the way home to their villages, resulting in a drastic drop in rural people's incomes. In Europe, Romanian migrant farm workers were endangered as countries like Germany and the United Kingdom imported them to address domestic farm labor shortage. How has this uh, uh, state of food insecurity come to happen? What has been the definition of uh, uh, food uh, 
situation problem in the world. I may be as expected in a world dominated by imperialism. This statement is more and more intensive food production. The intensification of food production has resulted in has resulted in wanton in wanton destruction of lives and property. The present food system has shown that most of the world's food uh, food systems reproduce inequalities and reinforce economic and political power. Such is the so-called industrial model of food production. This industrial intensification is an extractive practice that has unsettled the foundations of ecosystems, leading to increased global rate of soil degradation, erased erosion, and biodiversity loss. Industrial agriculture demands more territories. It demands larger scale monocrop farms, which expectedly, if one is to look at the more uh, traditional ways of farming systems, uh, this monocrop farming pollute land, air and water, and debase animal life. And worse, it grabs, it demands land and resources. Uh, this industrial model of agriculture also makes farmers depended, dependent on expensive inputs provided by agri agrochem corporations. Uh, you know that the billionaires of the world, the billionaires of the world just concentrated on the agrochem corporations has, have accumulated 1.9 trillion US dollars in 2020. Now we can imagine how much is their wealth by this time. And the so-called big four, big, big mega corporations in the world control 60% of the global seeds market and 75% of global pesticides market. So we see that in um, requiring farmers to depend on fossil fuel based machines and chemical inputs, displacing, as I said, long standing regenerative and integrated farming practices, many, many, but a few percentage of the world's population in the overall power relations have accu accumulated this grandiose wealth. But for, of course, intensified production is measured in terms of commodity output and not really, uh, shall I say, commodity output and profit, not really in terms of human and environmental health. No? So we see that in the food system analysis, in, uh, to say it short, the world has been dominated by corporations in food systems that use, take note, that use wealth to generate more wealth instead of using life to generate more life. Now, um, uh, in this struggle, in this hold of a few billionaires and trillionaires in the world, of the food system of the world, which affects wanton destruction, as I've said, to life, to the environment, at the cost of what? At the cost of the future of the world. Um, as I said, the struggle goes on and we call for food sovereignty when the peoples of the world, the toiling uh, masses of the world have only this choice as an essential component of uh, people's uh, liberation and the struggle for democracy to struggle for people's food sovereignty. People's food sovereignty is the power of the people and communities to assert and realize the right to food 
and produce food and earn decent livelihoods and fight the power of corporations and other forces that destroy the people's food production systems and deny them food and life. The culmination of this struggle for food sovereignty is the actual or full realization of people's democracy in all aspects of food and agriculture systems, including production and social relations, national policies and programs. Now, next week, come September 23, the United Nations Food Systems Summit or the UNFSS will be held in New York and is expected to map out the policy agenda on food, agriculture, and food systems for decades to come. This uh, food system summit is supposedly to unveil so-called game, game-changing solutions to the world's uh, problems on the food system. They have gathered uh, uh, experts, academics, and um, uh, government and state members uh, gather dialogues that they have initiated since the last quarter of 2019. These solutions will supposedly transform global food systems to accelerate toward meeting global goals, including eradicating, eliminating hunger, reducing poverty, and facing the climate crisis. So the problem of the world's food system is formulated that way. Find solutions. And already, as we keep track of what has been going on in the dialogues, we see the signs of corporate capture. What are the signs? And in a week's time, do we expect do we hope for something um, maybe earth changing to change in the orientation and the processes of this to be held food system summit? We do not. The signs that we saw early on, as early as 2020 are clear. The undemocratic decision of the UN General Secretariat to enter into a strategic partnership with the Billionaires Club, the World Economic Forum. Of course, the appointment of Agnes Kalibata, as you see here in the screen. Uh, she was the head of the Bill Gates funded Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa and a member of the WEF's Global Agenda Council. As the, she was appointed as the special envoy for this coming Food System Summit. We see we saw also, because it's still in the present, the FAO's alliance with the Agrochemical Industry Association, Crop Life International. Crop Life International is one of the champions in the five action tracks, which are being uh, deliberated upon in uh, the uh, advisory uh, council meeting and in the integrating committee of the summit. We see also the entrenchment of numerous corporate funded genetically modified pesticide and biofortification lobbies like the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition in the summit's action tracks, among others. Now, for the longest time, even before the announcement by Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, in uh, October 2019, that there will be a World Food Summit taking place next week. We have uh, the movements, the people's movements, by social movements have pushed back for the longest time. The hungry and they, they have been, for the hungry and marginalized people of the global south have been pushing back systemic solutions. They have been pushing systemic solutions that will not only only hold but reverse the rise in global hunger. We have tried to push back against big, big agrochem corporations. Uh, we have tried to push back policies of states and governments which are enabling this 
dominance of big, big corporations in the food systems. It's more imperative now that food producers and those at the margins are put at the helm of changing the system. It is us who are truly hungry for change, a radical change towards a just, equitable, healthy, and sustainable food systems. As I said, we are very proud to be partnering with the, the International Migrants Alliance in this struggle to attain a food systems that is truly owned, that is truly um, controlled, that is truly in the service of the toiling masses of the world. Thank you very much. And um, as long as we're here, maybe we can try to uh, discuss and converse with one another. We are here to listen. What you will be saying will be important in the next days. Um, teaming up towards the Global People Summit, which will be taking place uh, September 23, I, sorry, September 21 to 23. Uh, we will be seeing one another there. No? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great, great. Thank you, Ms. Sylvia. Um, thank you for your substantive presentation and the very important and meaningful message to, to all of us. You know, if the current state of the food system is not worse enough, this, this current uh, pandemic has highlighted it more. But I think one of the important uh, takeaway that I noted from your message, Ms. Sylvia, is that this pandemic is just one of the uh, you know, like other bigger factors that is causing this global crisis of hunger. Um, there has been a long-standing systemic violence in the form of food hunger that is being experienced by, by many of us, especially the vulnerable sectors in the society globally. And as migrants, we are not exempted into experiencing this. And so for the toiling masses of the world, uh, people's sovereignty is the power of people, and I'm quoting this from your, from your slide, you know, people's food sovereignty is the power of people and communities to assert and realize the right to food and produce food and fight the power of corporations and other forces that destroy the people's food production systems and deny them food and life. So thank you again, Ms. Uh, Ms. Sylvia, for your very meaningful um, message to us this afternoon. Okay, um, moving along, let us now, uh, we will be listening to our migrant sisters and brothers from Japan, New Zealand, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore on the living vulnerabilities that they and migrant workers face, especially in relation to food and during this time of pandemic. So um, I will call upon our migrant speakers consecutively with each of them given seven minutes to present. So to our participants, please feel free to write your comments, your questions or interventions on the, in the chat box if you're with us here in Zoom. Or for those who are in, in Facebook, you can also raise your questions out in our comment section. Um, for our first speaker, uh, we have uh, Sir Roger Raimundo. He is a Filipino uh, living and working in Japan. He is the Vice Executive Director of Caffin Migrant Center, an institution providing support and service to migrant workers in Japan. Um, Roger will share with us the challenges faced by migrant workers in Japan, especially those working in food manufacturing industry, especially those working in the food, uh, yeah, the manufacturing industry. So um, he is currently at work right now. So uh, he prepared a very brief pres video presentation so he will, however, join us later in, in our discussions at the open oh. forum. So, okay. Friends, let us listen. Oh, oh, so he's here with us joining uh, in live. Hello, uh, sir. Go ahead, take it away. Yeah, good afternoon. I was able to sneak out of the factory, so I, I took my time. <laughs> this is actually, yes. uh, yeah, first, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Roger, and I'm uh, I am currently living here in Japan for almost 10 years now, or more than 10 years now. Uh, Yes, uh, basically, uh, what we are going to share with you 
uh, maybe just a grasp of what is actually happening uh, when it uh, to to uh, the Japan uh, food industry, which basically hires uh, uh, more foreign uh, workers. Uh, but first, uh, 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 let me just give you a, a brief background of uh, 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 about uh, what uh, I'm going to share. So basically, this is a uh, this is more of a personal experience, uh, of course, for me, which I have been working on a food industry for more than 10 years on on basis of two companies already. Uh, so most of the sharings that I would uh, be able to share would be would, would come from my personal experience. And of course, with the current uh, uh, case study that we are doing right now uh, in terms of the Caffeine Migrant Center program of uh, uh, continuing the, to, to uphold and, uh, and uh, forward the struggle of migrant workers. So Japan currently, as we know, is a... Uh, Roger, yes. sorry. Um, if you can speak a little uh, more slowly so that our interpreters can follow. Thank yeah, you. sorry, sorry. Yeah, sure, sure. Yes, uh, Japan currently, uh, as we all know, uh, has been going on, on a recession since the since before the, the 2011 tsunami or the great earthquake. Uh, uh, Japan, for, for, for a a uh, few decades from now has been experiencing also the the decrease in uh, in population uh, and the population gap has been uh, growing widely every year so that's why japan is currently uh, is aimed at uh, hiring more foreign workers so where are these foreign workers coming from of course these foreign workers the uh, migrant workers are coming from southeast asian countries uh, like the philippines uh, uh, indonesia uh, thailand uh, uh, China, uh, Korea, and uh, some from Nepal and as, some as far as uh, Myanmar. So currently, uh, Japan has been hiring, uh, uh, already have at least uh, 1.6 million foreign migrant workers. Aside from the uh, workers, uh, migrant workers who were currently are uh, already uh, have resident uh, residency status here in Japan. For example, uh, for the case of the Philippines, we, the Filipino uh, population in Japan already is 330,000 persons at least. And 80% uh, of that population uh, are women, which because uh, affect, uh, impacted by the, uh, the first uh, tranche of, uh, tranche of um, uh, migrant Filipinos came here in Japan in the 1980s due to the uh, entertainment industries. Uh, but since then, uh, this migrant... Uh, uh, also, we call them as workers. Uh, uh, have already uh, already settled here and uh, you know uh, married to locals, and so they already have their families here. Uh, Seventy percent of of the Filipino population here in Japan, uh, because of the uh, impact of the entertainment industry, uh, uh, already have uh, seventy percent of them already have residency status, and from that three hundred thirty thousand around. 50 to 70,000 are my uh, for uh, migrant workers who who are uh, holding a uh, what we call technical trainee or internship visa some are student uh, visa holders but of course they are workers too and uh, just like that and uh, with regards to the in Japan food scarcity may not be the problem but the the need or, or the capitalist need of uh, of uh, mass production intensify the industrialization of food processing. This is uh, the main focus of uh, what is uh, the ongoing uh, problem when it comes to the migrant workers. So why is that? Uh, uh, our study shows that uh, since uh, a majority of uh, the Filipino population, uh, for example, who are already living here in Japan, are mostly employed through this, uh, in, in these uh, industries, like uh, from uh, farming, uh agriculture and also directly on uh, uh like me i am now working on a food factory and my back that's the, that's the factory i'm working or i'm working right now uh, uh we are making uh, salad uh, salad packs and uh lunch packs or dinner packs if you want to see some dinner so uh around uh, our study shows that more than 50 percent of migrant workers or or migrant filipino workers are being employed on this uh, on these uh, industries 
So uh, this is a whole line of industry, not only the direct uh, processing, but also, like I said, uh, from farming or from the agriculture sector up to the uh, supply, the whole entire supply uh, of food uh, processing industry in Japan uh, are hiring workers. Uh, recent, just recently, uh, the Ministry of Health and Labor and the Labor Standards Bureau conducted a uh, survey among uh, uh, industries or Japan uh, manufacturing industries who are hiring, uh, always are hiring foreign migrant workers. It is found out that around 70% of these industries, or at least our companies, have violated the, these, the actual labor standards implemented by the Japan Ministry of Health and Labor. And uh, most of uh, the violations are uh, in the forms of uh, 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 salaries, uh, discrimination, and other forms of abuse. So uh, it is, it is uh, just in this, uh, uh, with this pandemic uh, going on, such uh, violations are, are more intensive or should we say uh, the, the uh, number of cases emanating uh, from these kinds of violations actually uh, are being highlighted and are, are much going on a higher rate because companies are, are could easily, you know, uh, there are a lot of coming, uh, foreign workers coming here in Japan and, and uh, once they are having problems with, uh, for example, uh, high, uh, manpower agencies or uh, or with the current workers they're having, they could easily uh, dispense of, dispense of these workers, and you know there are a lot more coming in. So that's the that's the reason why most of the companies uh, could easily you know dismiss all these uh, violations and then just carry just carry on with the system. Uh, I think, uh, 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 of course, uh, our study this is still ongoing, uh, and uh, we are developing this case this case study to to. Uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, as a basis for for lobbying and uh, engagement with the with the Japan government when it comes to the protection and uh, upholding the human rights and the basic human rights of uh, migrant workers. So thank you. Uh, that's all I can share for today. Thank you. Okay. Raming salamat, Roger, for for gracing us with your time today, and uh, you thank know you, we thank really. You. We really appreciate that you, uh, even on your break, you still chose to spend that precious, precious time. Uh, <laughs> always, I always. Here on that very space, you know, is is already a strong statement of how important this this issue, this uh, this topic that we are discussing right now in the, in this afternoon. So thank you so much for um, for giving us a very practical story. Um, of experience that you yourself have experienced there on the ground in Japan. So, maraming salamat ulit, Roger. Okay, so for our next speaker, um, uh, our next speaker is Mandeep, Mandeep Singh Bella, uh, the president of the Union Network of Migrants, which is part of the first union in New Zealand and the coordinator for the Indian Workers Association. So, Mandeep will share with us the problems faced by migrant workers in New Zealand, especially those who have lost their jobs and in dire need of support from the government. So friends, um, help me to welcome uh, Mandeep. Thank you for introducing me. Um, so first of all, um, I, I'll introduce myself in the local Maori language, which is the indigenous language of New Zealand. Um, and it's timely because also um, this week is the Maori language week. So um, kia ora koutou katoa um, and sashikal to everybody. Um, so today I wanted to share with you all the situation in New Zealand. And before I do that, I just want to um, thank every all the participants today and um, just sharing our thoughts and solidarity with migrants in struggle and organizations who are supporting them. Um, it is really heartening to hear the stories and struggles of migrants around the world. Um, of course, in New Zealand, there they are struggles of migrants as well, but um, according to what I have heard, what's going on in a lot of the developing countries, it's, it's really, really um, sad to hear, especially when um, 
uh, access to food should be the basic right for everybody and everybody should have the basic right met and that and uh, that's including food shelter um as well so um i just want to quickly um also um um shared the solidarity with the farmers um, of India um, and particularly because they grow food and serve the country with food items. Um, it's been more than a year now that farm millions of farmers in India are protesting um, on the roads because of the capitalist government bringing in three legislative um, changes um, to the legislation which was going to privatize the, um, the food um, distribution and sale. Uh, and this is going to result in more inflated prices of food items, which are already quite high and uh, um, are not going to serve the people who are um, or in low income areas or people who don't have any source of income. So I'm um, showing solidarity to all the farmers in India who are still protesting to get those three laws abolished, um, which are passed by the capitalist government. Um, in terms of the situation in New Zealand, um, just uh, to share the data um, released by the Stats New Zealand, um, um, in the year ended in June 2020, one in nine children lived in households reporting material hardship. And, uh, and, and I'm talking about people who are New Zealand citizens. Food items in New Zealand are already really, really expensive, uh, which means people on low incomes are often um, is a struggle to make, make, the, um, to make ends meet. Um, and uh, particularly in the areas of migrants where uh, we, we do a lot of work uh, to represent migrants in New Zealand. Um, and the pandemic certainly didn't help either. In fact, it only brought out the, the material hardship which migrants often go through. So um, just to highlight the situation, um, at the moment, there are a lot of migrants who are stranded in New Zealand due to border closures. Many can't go back to, the, to their home country. And there are a lot of migrants who have lost their jobs. And there are a lot of migrants who um, have applied um, Sorry, I just see the message that I need to speak slowly. So um, um, I might um, pause a little bit. Um, yeah, so um, I'll try and speak slowly now. Um, so there are a lot of migrants in New Zealand who um, have lost jobs due to the pandemic. Um, and um, and there are a lot of migrants who are, are um, in the process of transitioning their visa to a new visa. Um, and there are a lot of migrants who are unable to work because their visa doesn't allow them to work, for example, if they are on a visitor visa or something. Now, those migrants um, are not eligible to receive welfare benefits, which uh, New Zealand citizens are entitled to. Welfare benefits are available to those people who, um, who don't have employment um, or if they lost the jobs and only New Zealand citizens or residents can apply for that. So people who are on visas, um, they are not eligible for receiving any kind of benefit. Um, during the pandemic, there have been many migrants who have been struggling to make ends meet and to pay their bills and to um, uh, you know, pay their rent and to, put their, uh, to make ends meet. And uh, we have heard really, really sad stories um, and uh, so uh, through Union Network of Migrants, we led a campaign um, along with the, the support of many other organizations, including, um, uh, you know, um, some of the MPs who um, we work alongside with to highlight the situation. And uh, um, there is a section in the legislation, um, uh, in the legislation, um, which meant that if the Minister of Social Development activates Section 64 of the Social Security Act 2018, which can only be activated during the pandemic situation, then those on temporary visas can also be eligible to receive benefits. Now, this was the perfect situation where the government had the opportunity to show kindness and to allow those migrants to also access benefits. 
However, for first um, few months, they, there was no action taken. Um, they, they, there have been uh, many stories of people struggling. So what we did, we worked with people uh, and organizations to highlight the situation and uh, um, to uh, also highlight it through the media. And um, we also wrote a letter to the ministers. Um, finally, the government um, announced that they will activate section 64, which means they allowed migrants to access benefits. However, just um, when we entered into, entered into another lockdown on 18th of August um, last month, the government announced that they're gonna stop emergency benefits for migrants uh, from 31st of August. Now, that is the moment when actually migrants need more support than ever. Unfortunately, the decision to stop the emergency benefit for temporary visa holders um, didn't sit right with us. And we, of course, um, uh, have written to the minister highlighting um, our disappointment with the decision. And uh, um, we are still um, trying to help as many migrants um, as we can. Uh, there has been a story of one of the migrants who was on the verge of committing suicide because she was unable to meet her immigration needs, uh, uh, immigration um, cost because um, she can't work while she's trying to wait for the for the visa. There have been a few other cases where migrants are asking for help, um, but there is no financial assistance available to them. The government response has been that those migrants can contact their local embassies, the embassies of the country, and uh, um, seek support from them, or they can um, get um, the government uh, support to be uh, repatriated back to their home country. For many migrants, this is not an option because they have already sacrificed a lot coming, moving over to New Zealand. And uh, um, the families back home have a lot of expectations of them. They have taken huge debt when they come to New Zealand. So a lot of them have a um, lot to pay back uh, to their families. So it's a very difficult decision for them and, and situation for them. So. Um, yeah, these are the some of the examples of um, uh, the um, the hardship which migrants are facing in New Zealand, and our campaigns are still ongoing. In fact, um, we um, have been trying to get a, a few more examples to highlight it in the media today as well, so we can, um, you know, get uh, hopefully get that Section sixty four approved again uh, for migrants. Um, but yeah, again, you know, international solidarity is also really really important and we extend our solidarity with the brothers and sisters all around the world and organizations who are supporting a lot of the migrants out there and uh, um, hopefully um, together we can bring about a change which is much needed for migrants thank you thank you so much um, and deep for your very meaningful sharing with us um, we are in solidarity with you as you um, as you think about the, your, uh, your, your fellow uh, uh, farmers in India, you know, like because of this legislative changes being pushed by, by your, your government to privatize their food distribution and we join you in the call so that uh, this, this law, this policy will be abolished so that it won't affect more low, -come, uh, low income areas in India. And you know about the case in New Zealand. I think it's very ironic to realize that our fellow migrant workers who who have fled our countries to better our lives, you know, experience more vulnerability in the countries that we thought who would help us. So we also join you in the struggle in the thought of addressing these issues of joblessness and visa transitions and lack of welfare benefit there in in New Zealand. So thank you so much uh, for that, uh, Mandy. Okay. For, we're now moving on to our next speaker, um, Purnima Shah. Uh, Purnima is a Nepali migrant worker in Hong Kong, a leader of Overseas Nepalese Workers Association, and one of the conveners of the Asian Migrants Coordinating Body in, in Hong Kong. So she will share with us the problems faced by the migrant domestic workers in Hong Kong in relation to food. 
And because she is currently at work, she has prepared a video presentation for us. Her colleagues from AMCV are here in the forum. So just in, the, just in case our participants would like to ask any questions later, um, maybe we can also address those questions to the, to the people from AMCV. So let us now listen to Pornima's presentation. Namaste and good afternoon. My name is Purnima Saha, the chairperson of Overseas Nepali Workers Association, and I am also the spokesperson for the Migra Asian Migrants Coordinating Body or MCB. MCB is an alliance of grassroots migrant domestic workers organization from Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. AMCB was formed in 1994 and have been active in fighting for migrants, workers' rights and justice for over 27 years in Hong Kong. Here in Hong Kong, there are 370,000 migrant domestic workers. We are from Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, Nepal, India, and other nationalities. Under the Hong Kong government regulation, we must live in with our employers with no protection for standard accommodation, working hours and food. We are also excluded hour of the minimum wage law here. So our salary is very low, around US dollar 600 a month. Under the standard employment contract, it is mandatory for employer to provide us with free food. Or if not, then employer must give a monthly, must employer choose to give food rather than food allowance. But here are our problems with increasing food in Hong Kong. Number one, problems with the food, free food. The Hong Kong government doesn't have a regulation on the standard food that employers must give to their migrants domestic workers. Many migrants complain that they do not have enough food to eat every day. And they are given only one or two meals per day. Most of us are given stand noodles or own small slice, a bowl of rice with little Dishes of leftover food. There are many who are not given a breakfast or sometimes slice of bread, but we are expected to, the, uh, there are many, but we are expected to walk up early to help children and all elderly prepare breakfast and send to the school of the school and other household works. We need food and energy to perform heavy duties early morning, but the food provided is not even enough to do this. The workers are more demanding due, during a COVID-19 pandemic, and we are even longer hours, up to 19 hours day. And many of us are not allowed to have day off too. Even in the house, employers have a lot of food, like a fruit and cookies and other items, but migrants, domestic workers are not allowed to eat them. If they eat the food without the permission, the employers will be angry or terminate our contract or roast, even accusing them of stealing the food. Few migrants, domestic workers are reported to the police for eating meatball and other types of food and several are jailed. There, that is the reason why we are forced to buy our own food with our small salary. So we will not go hungry and our body will be healthy. Number two, problem with the food allowance under the Hong Kong government regulation, employer can choose to give the food allowance of Hong Kong dollar 1,121 or less than US dollar 150. 
per month. If they do not want to provide free food, but this amount is very small, around the USD six per day. And it is not even enough to buy food to cook. Those who receive food allowance still struggle to around the healthy or nutrition foods. Price of food in Hong Kong, whether in market or supermarket are very expensive and continue to increase. During the pandemic, we are expected to send more money to our family, but many migrants are forced to spend 10% of our salary to buy extra healthy food and protective mask. Therefore, MCG is demanding to Hong Kong government and our consulate to regular, regulate the number one, regulate the standard of the decent food for migrant domestic workers. Number two, increase food allowance to USD 320 per month. Number three, allow migrant domestic workers who are not given decent food by their employers to make pro proper complaints and change employers without leaving Hong Kong. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to share our experience. Long live international solidarity. Thank you. Long live international solidarity. Thank you so much uh, for, uh, for Nima for, for your very challenging uh, message to all of us. So you know, right now, if you if you don't see it in 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 our Zoom uh, virtual space, there are some of us who has their um, who have their videos turned on, and they are some of them are in their working space, joining us in in this virtual forum that we're having today. And we would just like to acknowledge all of you. You know, this this goes to show how important this issue of hunger um, is. Uh, uh, for all of us migrants, this, this shows how important this is for all of us. Okay, so, um, you know, Purnima talked about the situation in Hong Kong and the migrant domestic worker situation there in, in Hong Kong is really challenging. So from accessing food to making it has become a problem faced by many of them. And indeed, only through collective struggle and movement building, movement building, we can change our situation. So, how are you all doing? Are you ready for our next uh, presenter? So, for our next uh, speaker, we have Ignatius. I hope that I pronounced that properly. Uh, he is from Taiwan. So, but Ignatius is in Taiwan, but he is an Indonesian factory worker since 2014 in Taiwan and was formerly the chairperson of the Indonesian Workers Association. So, Ignatius is is excited to share their situation with us, but is currently at work. So he, he also has prepared a video presentation. So he will speak in Bahasa Indonesia. So for our English speaking participants, uh, we invite you to go ahead to the English channel. And some migrant workers in Taiwan are also present in our forum today. So I guess we can also ask uh, from them directly later in our open forum. Let us hear it from Ignatius. Yang terhormat panitia penyelenggara dan seluruh teman-teman peserta yang hadir saat ini. Perkenalkan saya Ignas, pekerja migran Indonesia di Taiwan. Di sini saya akan mencoba memaparkan sedikit kondisi pekerja pabrik di Taiwan terkait dengan tema dalam pertemuan ini. Saat ini pekerja sektor formal yang bekerja di pabrik di Taiwan berjumlah 79.574 orang dengan gaji per bulan sebesar 24.000 NT dolar dengan potongan per bulan yaitu e, mes dan makan itu 2.500 NT dolar pajak 1.200 NT dolar askes 352 NT dolar astek 502 NT dolar dan biaya service agency 1.500 NT dolar Dengan potongan tersebut, maka sisa gaji per bulan sebesar 17.946 NT dolar. 
masa pandemi banyak pabrik di Taiwan berkurang produktivitasnya sehingga tidak ada lembur dan tidak ada lembur ini pekerja tidak bisa minta pindah dengan mudah padahal untuk berangkat kerja ke Taiwan membutuhkan biaya yang tidak sedikit dan sebagian besar PMI menjadi korban overcharging sehingga banyak pekerja yang harus menghemat biaya hidup agar kembali modal biaya tersebut dan tidak kalah penting juga untuk biaya hidup keluarga di rumah situasi yang tidak mudah dalam masa pandemi seperti ini ditambah lagi dengan situasi dan kondisi kerja yang buruk di mana kebanyakan pekerja migran sektor formal atau pabrik yang bekerja di pabrik itu bekerja dalam situasi yang biasa kita sebut dengan 3D dirty, difficult, and dangerous sangat rentan terpapar COVID-19 oleh karena itu harus memenuhi protokol kesehatan di Taiwan dengan menggunakan masker dan hand sanitizer dan perlu diketahui bahwa barang-barang tersebut PMI harus uh, beli sendiri agar imunitas terjaga juga harus memenuhi nutrisi dan gizi yang baik tentunya namun dilihat dari porsi makanan yang diberikan pihak majikan rata-rata tidak mencukupi walaupun itu dipotong dari gaji setiap bulan padahal dalam kontrak kerja disebutkan bahwa majikan harus memberi makanan yang cukup dan layak bagi pekerjanya namun kata layak saat ini belum bisa diuraikan seperti apa dan bagaimana maka dari itu kebanyakan dari kawan-kawan harus menyediakan sendiri agar makanan tercukupi karena pandemi banyak pekerja pabrik yang dilarang keluar mes atau dilarang libur dan tidak jarang disertai dengan intimidasi sehingga untuk belanja stok makanan juga terkendala dan solusinya adalah dengan belanja online yang tentunya lebih mahal karena harus menanggung ongkos kirim kebanyakan mes pekerja jadi satu dengan pabrik banyak ditemukan kasus di mana pekerja migran sama sekali tidak boleh mengolah makanan atau memasak di mes dengan alasan kebersihan dan keamanan dan menghindari kebakaran hal ini tentu memberatkan bagi pekerja migran karena harus membeli makanan yang sudah jadi bahkan beberapa waktu lalu di salah satu wilayah di Taiwan yang merupakan pusat industri otoritas tempat memperlakukan peraturan yang sangat ketat bagi pekerja migran yaitu pekerja migran tidak boleh keluar dari mes jika keluar akan langsung ditangkap polisi dengan alasan melanggar aturan penanganan pandemi larangan ini sontak membuat para pemerhati pekerja migran bereaksi karena dianggap diskriminatif dan melanggar HAM aturan tersebut tentu berdampak bagi pekerja migran bukan hanya dalam masalah pemenuhan akan kebutuhan makanan karena pihak pabrik tidak menyediakan tapi juga mempengaruhi psikis pekerja migran oleh karena itu kami berharap agar semua pihak memperhatikan kesukupan makanan bagi pekerja migran sebab dengan nutrisi yang seimbang akan meningkatkan produktivitas dan semangat kerja yang tentunya berdampak bagi perekonomian secara keseluruhan kita semua tahu bahwa pekerja adalah poros dasar perusahaan dan juga ekonomi negara Bukan hanya negara pengirim, tapi juga negara penempatan. Demikian paparan dari saya, terima kasih, dan salam solidaritas dari kami pekerja migran di Taiwan. Terima kasih. Terima kasih, uh, Ignatius. Uh... Thank you very much for your sharing to us with, with the situation of the Indonesian people, migrant worker in, in, in Taiwan. So friends, we are now um, in this uh, moment when we will be opening up the, our virtual space to open forum. So we are welcoming questions, comments, and interventions from our participants. So um, we will ask everyone to, those, especially those who are going to give some reflections to limit their the responses or their sharing for two minutes 
So this way we can accommodate as many of our participants as possible. So, so thank you. So do we have any reflections, questions or comments so far? And I hope maybe someone can help me um, catch any question. You can also unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question, give any reflection. Um, just make sure to address your question to some of our speakers. Okay, so we, we have here one, one question. Uh, this is addressed to Miss Sylvia. Uh, Miss Sylvia, this is a question. In, in what little ways can migrants participate in the campaign for food sovereignty? Yeah, hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, whatever his name or her name, I know she's a very good colleague. No? Uh, how to participate in this campaign? Um, one is to get better at what your organization is doing now. Uh, I think uh, what we always should have in mind is that power, you know? We have that power in us. We already have that because of our uh, this the uh, what uh, Ima uh, expresses now is the power of organization, and to continue mobilizing for all the issues in response in action to to what Mandip, uh, uh, Ignatius, our Nepali friend uh, have expressed. You no, know, to continue chipping away at the difficulties and forging on the issues and those little victories that we can. So in on all fronts and all, to continue pressure, uh, pressuring, I uh, will building that unity and uh, providing all those um, advocacies that solidarity work among ourselves and uh, helping one another. And then um, uh, having all these engagements with those that legislate, with those who make the rules, with those um, uh, which enable these big corporations to, to wreak this havoc on us. You know? And then um, to, to mobilize all our families, or all those who are not even members of uh, migrants associations, because this is one battle for all of us. Thank you so much, Ms. Sylvia, for that very um, meaningful response. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, like naming, naming all of these different issues and having this kind of forum is already uh, one effective um, way of um, educating and raising the issues of this hunger that we're all subjected to. So, so thank you very much, Ms. Sylvia. Do we have any other more questions? or reflections. Silence is okay, but... Um, Lennon is raising hand. Sorry, any? Lennon, Lennon from Taiwan. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah I didn't see that. Okay, go ahead, Lennon. Thank you very much, Nervon and everyone. Uh, it's Lennon. From I'm sorry, I, I opened it. Yeah, it's Lennon Wong from Serve the People Association, uh, SPA. It's like migrant. It's a liberal organization which offer the shelters for migrant workers in Taiwan. We offer the shelter for the Vietnamese, and Indonesian, and the Filipino migrant workers. Uh, I can I can totally uh, agree and I'm I'm sympathetic to our brothers and sisters sisters from other countries like in Hong Kong and also in Taiwan, we share many common problems. Even I myself, uh, I'm not a migrant worker myself, but my wife has been a migrant worker. She was a caretaker for seven years from the Philippines in Taiwan. 
And uh, so I'm deeply um, uh, inf influenced and I know the problems. Uh, I supplement a little uh, of what they didn't say. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, it has been a long time that it, it was quite peaceful in Taiwan. We had very few cases until April this year, but from late May until maybe around July, there were, there were a few months that there was a very strong local outbreak in Taiwan about the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So during these months, there were uh, outbreaks in some of the factories. So there were hundreds, at least hundreds of migrant workers, they were affected by the virus. And, but luckily, uh, as far as I know, uh, no migrants uh, really died from the disease. Uh, most of them, they were cured and they went back to work. But because of this pandemic, they, the, the reaction from the employer side is very, very negative. They try to control the mobility of the migrants. There was a, almost, almost like a nationwide ban for mobilities on migrant workers. It, it happened uh, sporadically since last year, maybe May and June last year in 2020. Uh, but sometimes it's uh, loosened, sometimes it's more it's, uh, stricter. And during May, after May and June this year, it became very serious because of the outbreak. So almost, you can say, almost no migrant worker can go out even on their day off. We accepted uh, a few cases from a very big semiconductor company in Taiwan. Actually, that's the number one, ASE two migrants, two Filipino migrant workers, they, they show that they use a very funny way to protest for the mobility ban. Because every day they have to move from the shelter, from the dorm to the factory, they cannot go out. They made a short video and they uploaded to TikTok. They made a few words in Tagalog saying that, do you know how to get out? Just wear your uniform and wear your tag. And, and that the guard won't stop you. And they were fired just for that. It's a total violation for the freedom of speech and for the freedom of uh, uh, um, mobility. And I supplement, uh, okay, I'm sorry, I'll make it very short. Just like Hong Kong, all the domestic workers in Taiwan, they have to live inside the house and they have to all to, to accept the foods from their employers and only the assigned foods just like our sister from Hong Kong mentioned, they cannot eat uh, what was not assigned for them. Even there are plenty of foods. If it's not assigned for them, they cannot eat. And we had, new, we had information uh, on and on that Indonesian Muslim sisters, they were forced to eat pork, which is a strongly violation to their religion. And also for the um, fishermen, we have two kinds of fishermen. One is the local fishing, who mostly they, they maybe they go to the sea every day or every other day. And there's another kind of distant water fishing. They will stay on the sea for a very long time. But both of them, they reported many cases of lack of foods. They don't really have, not all of them, but some of them, they, they don't have enough foods. And, uh, and also the water. So it, it really influenced, affects a lot about their health. And this is a very serious problem. So regarding the full sovereignty of the migrant workers, I supplemented uh, a, a little for uh, as the, my contribution. Thanks a lot. Wonderful. No, yo, yeah, thank you so much uh, for that, uh, Lennon, for, for adding a more, you know, like context uh, of practical experiences that our uh, migrant workers are experiencing both in Hong Kong and there in, tai in Taiwan. So we have here two things on our chat box, but so we have one question and we have one reflection, but let me go ahead and read the question first so that I don't know who this is addressed to, um, but while our um, presenters are thinking of a response, I will read the, the comment from, from one of our um, attendees. So from Dewey Amelia, um, asking, so migrants are accused as theft for eating food and employers at employer's house. What makes the employer did not provide enough food to their worker? I think, um, I think it's like a more of a, 
um, a rhetorical question, but let me read this comment from Anisura. I think Anisura is having some troubles on his um, speaker. So I'll read this for you. Uh, Bangladesh is a small land overpopulated of 160 million peoples. The highest migration cost in, man in Bangladesh, that, okay. So this amounts are more than 15 to 20 months of salary. Most of his money arranged by high interest loan. Moreover, their salary is very low, but they can't avoid their daily expenditure, house, rent, kids, educational expenses, medical and medicine for family. They have to pay their loans, etc., in home countries. Normally, they run with negative budget. To cost minimize, adjust their overall budget, migrant workers have to, com uh, to comprise with their, with their maybe comply their daily food and low uh, rent house, which food values and residential atmosphere of hygiene not maintained properly. Uh, at a, as a result, they are frequently suffering by lots of disease, physical weakness, etc. So thank you so much for that reflection, Anisu. So does anybody would like to comment from uh, Dewey's um, question maybe we okay. can ask anyone in the uh, room to share uh, to answer the question because some of the speaker are not uh, here in person maybe anyone can answer the question maybe uh, in terms of that, if you can, if it, if it, if it, then we can invite our migrants from Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, or even other countries to share their experience when it comes to food. That will be, yeah, that, that's going to be better. So um, does anybody would like to respond to this? So um, I'm reading this question uh, from Dewi. She's, uh, uh, it says there that, so migrants are accused as theft for eating food at employer's house. What makes the employer did not provide enough food to their worker? Does anybody has like a similar experience related into this? Maybe our friends from Hong Kong could respond to this as this is a very, uh, I think, relevant issue to, um, um, to Hong Kong. Can I speak from Bangladesh? Hi, Pervez, yes. Hi, thank you so much. Um, uh, basically, uh, thanks, uh, Arnish Ruhman Khan, uh, for raising this question about the food security. Um, basically, Bangladeshi female migrant workers, our teachers, they're facing these kinds of problems in, in Middle Eastern countries, especially uh, every day we are, uh, we are getting complaints against the, you know, uh, food, uh, lack of food in the destination countries. So we found that uh, basically two things that in Bangladesh we are used to, uh, you know, having food on, based on rice and uh, others. But in Middle East they are um, they have their traditional food or cultural food. So that is the other uh, reason. So employer are not providing the food that basically we are used to in destination countries. And that's why most maximum time our female uh, migrant workers complaining that they are not getting enough food to eat and to live over there, and they are uh, they are getting sick day by day. Besides that, uh, Anisu raised the question about the you know migration cost and the salary, and as well as you know uh, uh, their living condition is really vulnerable due to the very uh, small amount of salary or wages and also they have to maintain their family in the home country so uh, even due to the pandemic they also face huge problems uh, lack of food in uh, in destination countries we found that the, because of our demand and also the demand from the migrant workers uh, Bangladesh government provided a little food during the pandemic but it was very um, small small amount of food uh, uh, they provided and Bangladeshi migrants demonstrated before the you know Bangladesh embassy in the different countries 
they need food when the pandemic was happening. Uh, still, pandemic is going on. In, in, the, in Malaysia, uh, thousands of Bangladeshi migrants now in a standard, they don't have salary. They have to return in Bangladesh and they are stranded in the destination countries. I need to Bangladesh, so they are facing this kind of problem. So if we will not address this kind of problem at this moment, I think the destination country government, employer, and the Bangladesh government should take immediate action to provide food to the stranded Bangladeshi migrants in destination countries. And even the migrants who face, uh, you know, who are trapped for the irregular migra migration, especially the Iraq, uh, the, the Mediterranean uh, irregular migrants, and the, who are staying in the jungle in in e European Union, they are also facing this kind of, uh, you know, lack of food. Uh, shelter everything so we need to consider this issue very strongly i would uh, uh, i would like to appeal that in dcm we need to address this food security problem uh, and when they are stranded when they traffic or in work condition we need to you know consider their safety uh, security on food and everything thank you so much thank you so much for this for that um, extensive um, response uh, we have more comments um, and reflections and some questions on our comment, uh, on our comment, on our chat box. Um, but for the interest of time, I think um, I'm going to invite everyone to engage in conversations on the comment section. But let me just read a few more questions that maybe our speakers and some of you may be able to res uh, respond to here in our, um, in our Zoom call. So this is a question from Chester to Mandeep. Uh, Mandeep, what, what industry in New Zealand is major, is majority of migrants working to? Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I, I, I did respond in the comment section, but yeah, migrants in New Zealand work in a lot of different industries, um, yeah, for example. But however, there is a particular group of migrants who work in particular industries. For example, we got uh, Filipino migrants who work in, a um, lot of Filipino migrants who work in um, uh, in the construction industry, hospitality and healthcare. And uh, there are a lot of migrants from countries like India. They mainly work in retail, IT and uh, um, horticulture sector as well. Um, however, it's um, the, it's all spread across different sectors and um, of different ethnicities. Yeah. Thank you so much for that response, Mandy. Okay, so I'm trying to catch more questions. If we have some more here on the comment on our, on our chat, chat box, we have a uh, reflection from Anisur. I invite you to read that too. And some additional reflections from Lennon. Uh, can I ask Devi, uh, can I answer Devi's question since no uh, people are having problem of sharing that experience of, uh, uh, you know, employer giving food to us in the context of a migrant domestic worker. Um, so uh, the food, uh, when it comes to live-in domestic worker, there is no regulation at all in Asia, uh, especially in Asian countries, on food. Uh, that means that uh, it is assumed uh, employer is obliged to provide free food. That's why we call it free food. Now, uh, employer will also include that in their day-to-day -day costs when they spend money to grocery and cooking. So they because many of the employers are also middle class, they are also trying to tighten their expenses. So many of them are uh, cutting down their uh, grocery uh, costs. And that means the domestic worker who are uh, cooking uh, must squeeze all these um, uh, daily expenses they use for to buy food. And in most cases, employer will, uh, you know, they end up of not having enough food. For example, employer will only cook uh, twice a day or maybe only once a day. 
So what are we eating for breakfast and lunch is the question because they are not at home and children are also at school. So most employers are just arranging them to either eat bread or maybe a cup noodle or instant noodle. So domestic workers are very, very familiar with a cup noodle or instant noodle throughout our migratory journey as a domestic worker. And then, uh, so that's one of the food issue. And then uh, employer will usually tell you or not telling you uh, indirectly, but uh, eventually is uh, there is uh, invisible regulation within the house. You should not eat food that is not given to you. So even the food is there, uh, fruit, cookies, uh, you know, sausage or egg and so forth. You must ask permission directly from your employer. There are very few employer who will really uh, generous to their food, like just eat whatever in the house. But in general, uh, they will really come up with that kind of regulation, what food you can and you cannot eat. So that's also another issue that domestic worker uh, uh, face. And in the case of uh, our uh, legal cases in Hong Kong, few of them who actually dare to eat food that employee did not give them, like uh, the Filipino domestic worker who eat um, uh, meatball, she was in prison for two months for eating the meatball. And the employer really report that to the police. Now the ground of the legal case on that is actually not the food itself, but what they call it a breaching, a breaking of trust. So that means employer trusts you to keep the house and respect the house. And suddenly you are breaking that rule by eating the food that is not given to you. Another case if Indonesian uh, who was actually imprisoned for uh, several months because he was given, uh, you know, the, the bird nest by the elderly mother, uh, the grandmother, but the daughter doesn't like it. And then they use that to report that she is uh, consuming the food that they supposed not for her. And she was really taken uh, as a criminal by the police and in prison for that. So that kind of simple uh, example of how access to food is, is very uh, difficult uh, for the live in domestic worker. That's why we have to rely to our small salary just to buy extra food so we can live on within the employer house. And another reason also, many of the food are very, very Chinese or local while we are very Southeast Asian, you know. So that's another thing why uh, some migrants, of course, choose uh, to buy our own food, but that's not really the main reason. The main reason really because we cannot really eat whatever in the house, even when the food are available. When the food expired, your employer just tell, it, tell you to throw it away. So that in our, you know, like that become very sad because we cannot, we are not allowed to eat, but then the food expired, you must throw it. So, yeah. Great. Thank you so much for that response, Annie. So, um, friends, we will have to uh, close the open forum for now. And we would like to thank you, uh, everyone, for your active participation in the discussion on food security and sovereignty and why our migrants uh, and why we migrants and our families need to be involved. And we, we really need to be involved in, 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 this, um, in this issue and in this um, sovereign, call for sovereignty. Um, so I, I, we recognize that you have some statements, some reflections that you have written on the chat box. Um, we may not be able to address all of your questions right now in the forum, but we will release a synthesis report or an article about this forum that we can um, send to you. So this Zoom call, it will end, but um, as you know, we have our uh, Facebook Live happening simultaneously. So I encourage you to maybe uh, post some of your reflections, some of your comments. And if you have questions, I'm going to invite each one of us, all of us are, are experts of our situations, right? Of our conditions. So let us engage one another on that comment section in, in, in this, uh, in, at the Facebook um, live streaming that we have. It will be on, um, it will be at, where is it right now? I guess we can share with you the link later on the chat box and maybe you can follow that from, from there. Okay, so um, to conclude our forum, uh, I'm going to invite back with us the chairperson of the International Migrants Alliance, friends and comrades, let us uh, welcome again, uh, Annie Lestari. Annie?
Thank you, thank you for the very great facilitation today, but special thanks also for all our speakers, Sylvia, Mandip, Roger, Ignas, and Purnima for wonderful sharing. And also thank you to all migrant participants. Uh, we understand that this is your working hours, but uh, you are taking time while you are cooking, you know, working in the factory and other uh, sector to participate in this event. We really uh, appreciate your participation and we hope you are able to share what you want to share to the world, but also to learn the experience of other migrants in terms of life condition and especially about food. Also, we thank all the advocates and supporters who are present today. You witness how difficult uh, situation that we are facing on the ground, not only about labor rights, even access to food, uh, is, is becoming very, very uh, precarious and very dangerous to our health and sustainability. And you also witness how uh, migrant workers are very enthusiastic to even learn about different issues that really matter to our life and condition. And the, the last thing is to the interpreters, Haninda and Sring, uh, for helping us. So what are the conclusion of our sharing today? One, that we are really, uh, migrants are hungry too. Even before we leave our country, we are already victim of hunger back home. We are forced to leave our countries because we are really being, uh, our resources are being taken away by the big corporation, by governments, and also many of us are forced into informal labor, especially when it comes to women with no protection at all. And yet, while we are suffering on the ground, being displaced and also taken away our resources, there is also lack or even no government assistance. The COVID-19 pandemic really revealed all those issues. The poor become poorer in time of pandemic. And also, uh, we also witnessed that despite the lockdown and also travel restriction, the corporate does not stop. They continue with their project, with their plantation, with their mining, continue to take away our resources and also our land. So this is really the reason why we know that migration will not stop, even we want it to. In time of pandemic like this, people who become migrants or we are overseas now are really looking forward to find a place where we will live with dignity and also sovereignty. And that is there is no other way except our home country. But unfortunately, with this kind of uh, corrupt government, with the corporate grabbing our political, economic, and social cultural life, then we really have no even hope in our home countries. And this is the reason why more and more people are leaving our countries, regardless of our educational background, our gender, our ethnic, we are forced to leave the country to become temporary migrants throughout our life. And yet when we migrate, we also become, we are recruited as a temporary workers in different sector, including and particularly in the agricultural, fishing and other food factories. We become the major source of cheap and the cheapest temporary labor that benefit mainly the international corporate and also the host governments. We experience hunger while we are working overseas. We experience violence, violence to the standard uh, rights, even for formal workers. Our salary, food, rest day, working hours, and many more, even for those who are falling under formal category of migrant labor, they are experiencing all those things. All the more when you are informal labor, like migrant domestic workers. Many of us also lost job, salary cut, because of the closure of the company, termination of even our employers, lockdown and travel restriction. Lack of food, we are also suffering from lack of food and force to use our small income to buy our own food. We listen, even factory workers are not given food and yet they are not allowed to cook. And with the small money they have, what kind of decent food they can afford. Of course, they will have to rely to can food throughout their employment overseas. And even for migrant uh, domestic workers, we are forced to buy our own food and spend at least 10% of our salary for extra food so we will not be infected during the COVID-19 pandemic. We are also being terminated and criminalized 
if we try to eat the food that is not authorized or given to us by our employers. So even the food are there, but we have no right to eat those food. And we, are, we feel very sad when the time, when the food is rotten or expired, the employer can easily say, throw the food. While when the food is fresh, we are not even allowed to toss the food. And yet also in time of pandemic, we are excluded from COVID-19 welfare benefit, financial benefit and other form of aids is not even available for us. So who we can rely on except to our own organization and even our local supporter to help us with this kind of difficulties. The impact of lack of this food security for migrants is really great. Our health continue to deteriorate and many of us even died. Many migrants, the longer we, were, we work overseas, will have to suffer a chronic kind of disease from cancer, hypertension, failure of organ, and so forth. So friends, we are very pleased that PCFS invite IMA to join this kind of global campaign on food security and sovereignty. Food is really part of migrants' campaign, but we are not really Try, we haven't really uh, focused on that as one of a major campaign. And I completely agree that food should be part of our campaign and our concrete demand. We should not shy and feel ashamed of talking that we are hungry. We understand in some culture talking about food is so it sounds, uh, uh, you know, um, insig in insignificant. And we don't want to be labeled as complainant migrants who cannot even thank for whatever given to us. But from the testimonies we hear today and from the explanation of the PCFS, we know that food and hunger is really the challenges that everyone face across the world, including the migrants. So what demands we can carry on this month and onwards during this uh, critical point of uh, during this uh, government, government meeting on food? First is we must demand to our employers and companies to provide decent food we should also struggle it and we should not just give in to employers for whatever they give to us. We have to assert our right that we are also workers and human who need food and decent food to be able to work properly. Second, we must also campaign. We must also campaign and advocate to the government and other international institution like the United Nations, International Labor Organization, for them to regulate standard of decent and nutritious food for migrants. We believe that there is such explanation on what is decent and nutritious food for the, a human being. And that is not different with what migrant needs. So why not having that kind of standard? So national government will also have to follow that kind of standard when they treat their migrant workers. The third is also to demand for financial relief and other welfare benefit to all migrants, regardless of our sector and also immigration status during this COVID-19 pandemic. One of the consequences of the pandemic that migrants are hungry. Many of us are getting hungry and hunger and every single day. And then the fourth is support and stand with our farmers and other food producers to fight for food security and sovereignty. Their fight is also our fight and therefore we should stand with them. Our own families are also food producer, farmer, fisher folk and so forth. And the last thing is we the migrants must join the People Global Summit on Food System led by the PCFS that will happen on 21 to 23 September. We should unite with our brother and sister who are fighting for food security and sovereignty that will also include our families back home, our community back home, but also us as a migrant workers. Thank you very much and long live international solidarity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Long live international solidarity indeed. Thank you so much, Annie, for your powerful conclusion. Yeah. Um, your message breathes fire to our hearts as we join the campaign and call for sovereignty and security. So friends and comrades, at this point, uh, we're going to request for you to turn on your videos and show your placards. I don't know if you made yours. I've seen some of you did. So um, 
If you can turn on your cameras, we're going to uh, show our posters, our placards for our photo op. Who's taking photo? <laughs> and then join us into chanting, okay? So our chant will be uphold people's food sovereignty and uphold just food systems. Okay, ready? Are your cameras turned on? Let's do the chanting first before we do the photo op, okay? Uphold people's food sovereignty. Uphold people's sovereignty. Uphold people's food sovereignty. Uphold people's food sovereignty. Uphold just food systems. Uphold just food systems. Uphold just food systems. Uphold just food systems. Wonderful. Great. So, okay, everyone, just uh, keep on turning on your cameras, show your faces, and show your uh, posters on, on your camera. Who's taking pictures? <laughs> I am. Okay. Up. After that. <laughs> We're good. Great. Again, thank you so much, everyone. This is yeah. it important forum as it helps us understand better uh, what food security and sovereignty means and you know uh, what it means for our collective engagement to keep on pushing so thank you everyone and thank you thank you thank you everyone see you next thank week. you everyone thank you long live international Bye. solidarity Long live, Long, live Long, live Long, live Long live international solidarity. Long live international solidarity. Long live international solidarity. Long live international solidarity.